Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Today I would like to welcome our new tribal elder Ashwin Mutz. Ashwin Mutz. Ashwin Mutz. Thank you so much for your generous contribution to the Game Engine programming series. In the last video I gave a high level introduction of block compression formats and their different use cases. Now that we are familiar with these texture formats, we are going to use DirectX text library to encode imported textures. Let's write the function for texture compression. Here we take the texture data with the import settings and a reference to the scratch image that contains the loaded images and their mitmaps. We should only call this function if the import settings compress field is set to true, or in other words, only if the user wants to use texture compression. One feature that I'd like to have for compressed textures is the ability to determine the best PC format for the texture. As I explained in the last video, there are different use cases for each format and we'd like to select the best one without bothering the user. Therefore, I'm going to write a function that examines various properties of the texture and determines which PC format can be best used. However, we only use this if the user didn't explicitly provide the format to be used for compression. So we are done if it's set to anything other than the XGI format unknown. If the texture is HDR or already has a BC format that is used for HDR textures, we set the output format to BC6, which is an HDR format. Otherwise, if it's a single channel texture, we use the grayscale BC4 format. Next, we can check if the texture is a normal map. I'm going to write this function in the next video. It will look at the average color of the texture and determine if it looks like a normal map. If the texture is a normal map, we'll use a two-channel BC format, which is BC5. This is because we only need two components of a unit normal vector. We can calculate the Z component in shader, and since this is always positive for normal maps, we don't have to have a sign bit. If the texture is sRGB, I override its format to uNorm. I found that this gives better results if the normal map is saved in sRGB format, which in general shouldn't occur, but I've seen normal maps saved in sRGB before, so that's why. Finally, if none of these cases were true, we use a BC format for color textures. These are BC3 and BC7 formats, and we pick one depending on whether or not the user preferred a BC7 encoding. Finally, we check that we have a valid BC format.
If the format supports alpha channel, we set the corresponding flag. At the end, we use an sRGB format if the original texture format is also sRGB. Note that this only makes sense for BC1, BC3 and BC7. It has no effect when we are using other compression formats. That's it for this function, but let me also use a reference to import settings to make it more readable. By the way, this whole CPP file is obviously the first draft of the code that we'll be using to create textures. In time, we'll improve it in order to handle more edge cases. Let's get rid of this error by writing a dummy function. As I said, I'm going to implement this in the next video, but at least now we can build the Content Tools project. Let's continue with the compression function. We'll need a new scratch image to contain the compressed texture data. BC6 and BC7 formats can be compressed using a compute shader on the GPU, which is many times faster than encoding the texture using the CPU. So if it's one of those formats, we'll use the GPU, otherwise we call the compress function of the DirectX text library that does the CPU encoding. We provide the array of images, image count, metadata and the output format. We can also tell this function to use multiple threads for encoding. The alpha threshold is only used for BC1 format and textures that use the alpha channel. The result will be written to BC scratch image. If compression failed, we set the corresponding error and return an empty scratch image. Otherwise, BC scratch is returned. Let's write can use GPU function next. Here we use a switch to determine if we have a format that can be encoded using a compute shader. DirectX text library supports GPU encoding only for BC6 and BC7, which are the most computationally expensive formats. Encoding other BC formats can be done fairly quickly on the CPU. Now, in order to use the GPU, we need to create a device similar to how we did it for the DirectX 12 renderer. However, here we need a DirectX 11 device, which is what DirectX text needs in order to run the compute shader. We only need to try and create a device once. So if the device was already created, then we can reuse it. If we attempt to create a device and it fails for some reason, we will not try to create it again either. I'm going to use the Compator class, which will release COM objects when we don't need them anymore. I expected Compator to be accessible through this header, but I guess I'm wrong. So I don't know what this header is doing here. Let's replace it with WRL header. This will include the Windows header right here, which defines min-max macros, unless we tell it not to do that. So that's what I'm doing here. We are going to support multi-GPU systems. Most computers have a discrete graphics card, and often there's also an integrated GPU available on the CPU. So we can use both for encoding when we are creating multiple textures at the same time. Therefore, we need a bit of thread synchronization, so each device comes with a mutex. We need an additional mutex to prevent multiple threads from creating a device at the same time. And we need a list of devices. Most of the time, it will contain one or two devices, depending on how many GPUs are found on the system. When we get here, we lock the function using device creation mutex, so only one thread can create the device. Let's write this function next.
We do nothing if the array of devices is not empty. The rest of this is done pretty much in the same way as I did in this video, except here we create a direct 3D11 device. So first we need to create a DXGI factory, which is used to enumerate video adapters. We use explicit loading of DLLs to load the DXGI dynamic link library and get a function pointer to a function that creates the factory. We can use the static variable here to check if the library was already loaded. Although in general I am not fond of doing it this way, this is just a quick and dirty way of writing a few functions to create a D3D11 device. After getting the function pointer, we can call it to create a factory, and we return true if that was successful. In that case, we are going to use the factory to figure out which graphics cards are available for use. I pretty much copy pasted this function from here, which is a utility program in DirectX text repository for converting textures. Each manufacturer has a vendor ID that we can use to determine if a video adapter is discrete or integrated. We assume that Intel adapters are integrated. However, at the time of this recording, Intel has introduced discrete GPUs, but since they are still lacking in performance relative to AMD and Nvidia, it's okay to put them last on our list. Hopefully this will change in the future. We can get each adapter using an index until there are no more adapters. If it's not a warp adapter, which is a software emulator for the hardware, we add it to our list. If the list has more items and the adapter is made by either AMD or Nvidia, we bring it to the front of the list. Come to think of it, I'm not sure if AMD integrated GPUs also have the same vendor ID, so this might not be the greatest solution, but let's go with it for now. Again, we use explicit DLL loading and get a function pointer to the creation function for D3D11 devices. Let me fix a couple of typos before I continue.
Now we try to create a device for each adapter. Please consult the Microsoft documentation if you'd like to know more about the function parameters here. For each created device, we first add a new entry in the list of devices and then assign the device. The reason for doing it like this is that we have a mutex in our data structure that can't be copy constructed. That's all for create device function. Now when we call can use GPU function for the first time, it will create a device for us and return true if there are one or more GPUs available for encoding BC6 and BC7 formats. In that case, we can compress one texture per device at a time. Therefore, we need synchronization for when there are multiple textures to be encoded. To do so, we try to lock the mutex for each device. If the mutex was locked successfully, we can call the compress function with the current device. After compression, we unlock the mutex. If we couldn't get hold of any device, then we wait for 200 milliseconds and try again. The only thing that's left to do is writing the normal map identification function and the decompress mip maps function, which we'll do in the next video. Before wrapping it up, I'm going to add the shutdown function that we need to call in order to release the devices. We'll see how this is used in one of the coming episodes. And that's it for today. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!